Oxford Micromechanics Group. Like that was written on the screen. And I think um, Dr. Anna has, Dr. Korea is now working on some HR EBSD and also a lot of nano indentation testing on for micromechanics and to extract mechanical properties. And he, Dr. Korea finished his PhD in University of Leicester and working on nano scratch testing. I think, think now her work, current work, will also continue on this mechanical testing. So now let's welcome Anna to give us a talk. Please. Thank you very much. Um, so, yep, thank you for inviting me today. Um, I know that this is probably the most boring title of a talk you've ever seen, so I hope I don't, I don't lose you all. Um, from the first slide. Um, but yeah, so I'm Anna. I'm a David Clark Research Fellow um, in the OMG group. Um, and I'm going to show you some work where I use nano indentation to test nuclear steels. Um, so kind of to start with, I know that some like a few of you do work on nuclear materials, but for those of you that don't, um, I'll just give a bit of an introduction slide. Um, so in terms of nuclear materials, we, we need advanced structural materials. Um, and the reason being, we have um, the development of generation for reactor designs, um, and these are going to be operating at higher temperatures um, and significantly higher levels of irradiation damage. So displacement stratum is um, kind of the uh, the level um, the 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 damage level that we um, we assign to a material. Um, so this is currently where we're at at the moment, um, and so essentially we're pushing it a lot, to much higher temperatures and higher DPA levels. So we want materials that can withstand these environments. Um, and there are many candidate materials that have been selected, and they all have a um, an operating temperature window. But if we go beyond that window, um, we get into this region where we get thermal creep uncertainty, and below that operating temperature window we have um, problems with radiation and embrittlement um, and that's obviously a really big problem for a structural material so we want to develop new materials and we also want to kind of understand more about what's going on in these candidate materials um, so in terms of radiation damage when we expose the material to radiation damage sorry to a neutron environment um, we get this damaged microstructure so that kind of has um, you you displace your atoms um, and you create this cascade of damage in the material with your interstitials um, and vacancies are created in the material. So you get dislocation loops um, and you get voids in the material. And that that kind of is this typical damaged microstructure that we would get. Um, and that has implications on the mechanical properties of your material. So in terms of our stress strain curve, we get an increase in our hardness, which um, will reduce the ductility and work hardening capabilities. You can get segregation and precipitation in the material, which would then lead to further embrittlement. Um, and also we get this kind of plastic instability and, um, and necking after the yield point. So all these phenomena are going to have detrimental effects um, on our mechanical properties for a structural material. And so we kind of need to characterise these materials um, and if we are developing new materials, just kind of characterise how they're going to respond in this environment. Um, but that isn't straightforward. So in terms of um, testing nuclear materials, we need to first put our samples into a test reactor. Um, and to achieve a damage level of, of kind of a reasonable amount, um, it's going to take a very long time. So you have a very slow dose rate inside a reactor usually much longer than the duration of a typical PhD. Um, and then to when they're removed, you've got these radioactive materials that need specialist um, handling equipment. And so even from getting it, getting it from the reactor to the, the hot cell facilities, that is a very difficult and complicated process. And so in terms of getting this, these these experiments and measure characterizing these materials, um, it's it's really not that efficient. It takes a long time and it's very expensive. 
Um, and in terms of like a rapid characterization of materials, that's going to be, um, it, it's, it's not ideal, basically. So instead, what we can do is use um, ion beam radiation. So we can either use heavy ions or protons, um, and you can emulate the damage in your material. So you can em um, emulate this damaged microstructure. Um, and it's a lot quicker, so you can achieve much higher dose rates. Um, they're not radioactive, so you can handle them in your labs and carry out all your testing. And um, it's relatively cheap compared to this, this larger scale reactor campaign. Um, but the problem with that is that you're only going to get this really small um, layer, so a very shallow layer of damage on the surface of your material, which is why we're going to need um, some uh, a small scale mechanical testing methods to predict the, the bulk mechanical properties. Um, and one way to do that is using nano indentation. So I've used nano indentation here as a method to characterize the mechanical properties of some dual iron irradiated T91. Um, so T91 is a nine chrome ferritic martensitic steel um, and it's, it's a real steel so a lot of these studies are usually done on, um, on model alloys but this is this is definitely a real steel um, and this is kind of the, the as tempered microstructure and as you can see it's a, a really complicated microstructure. So you've got dislocation lines, you've got some carbides, precipitates and also subgrains. And if you look at the grain structure, um, you've got these kind of lath um, grains and it's a very fine, fine grain structure. Um, so it's quite a complicated microstructure to start with. And then we do our dual iron irradiation. So the dual iron irradiation for these samples were done at the Michigan Iron Beam Laboratory. Um, and they use five MeV of iron ions um, to irradiate the sample with a co-injection of um, helium ions. Um, and the samples that I'm going to show um, throughout this talk have these conditions here. And although the, uh, the, the levels of DPA that are selected and concentrations in helium do look quite random, um, to give a bit of context, these have been selected to match conditions of a bore 60 reactor campaign. Um, and the bore 60 is a neutron, um, is, is a reactor in, in Russia. So they'll be matching neutron irradiated samples. Um, and essentially we were looking at this kind of temperature series, so a range of temperatures. Um, and once you've done the irradiation, you get this, this typical damage profile. So as a function of depth into the surface, you get um, this, this level of DPA that increases. And then you also get this kind of um, helium concentration profile. And for the purpose of this work, um, to match the reactor irradiations, we're interested in the properties and microstructure at this kind of 500 to 600 nanometer depth below the surface. Um, so if you do nano indentation into the surface, um, I've used CSM nano indentation, which is the continuous stiffness method. So you are um, continuously measuring the stiffness as a function of indent indented displacement so that you can measure hardness as a function of depth. You can measure the unirradiated and the irradiated side of the same bar. So both sides of these, um, both of these have been exposed to the same temperature profile. Um, you, this is kind of a characteristic nano indentation versus depth kind of curve you'd get for these materials. Um, but in terms of the 16.7 DPA that we're interested in in this sample, um, what what would the hardness be at that point? Kind of where where would you select that hardness from on this curve? Now, if you were to select it from this five to 600 nanometer depth, that's probably not going to be representative because if you think of your indenter, if you indent to a particular depth, you've got this plastic zone of damage that extends significantly deeper um, into the underlying material and this um, unirradiated region of the material. But then at shallow depths, you also have a problem because you have this indentation size effect. So kind of, although it's a really useful method and you can get these curves out quite easily, um, interpreting this data is, is a bit more complicated and it's quite important to kind of 
identify what you're measuring in this case. Um, and then you also get your modulus as a function of indented displacement. Um, and it's always good as a sanity check because you wouldn't expect your modulus to change as a function of depth and you wouldn't expect it to change um, from the irradiation damage. And so just to check that you've got a well calibrated indented tip and also you're correcting for any compliance in the machine. Um, this is this is kind of a good way to check that, to check that your modulus is nice and flat. Um, OK, so that that image there I just kind of made on PowerPoint, but in a, a real a real um, kind of indent. Uh, this is the GND map from EBSD, um, and that's a, a 600 nanometer indent. And if you look at the scale bar here, that's two microns. And so our plastic zone is extending significantly deeper below the material, and that's kind of what what we'd expect. Um, and so if you look a bit closer at the data, so these are all the individual curves. I've done 15 indents. Um, for each. So on the previous slide, that was the average of 15 indents. Um, and if we zoom in, so this is a, a 100 to 400 nanometers displacement. In the unirradiated material, we get this kind of smooth decay in our hardness, um, which is indicating a size effect, and that's and that's very normal. In the irradiated case, you get this, this transition. Um, which always isn't always as obvious, but I think with experience you get to identify it quite easily. Um, and you can sort of select the depth at which you see this transition here. Um, and that's useful because if we're going to assume that our plastic zone extends linearly with indentation depth, then at this 250 nanometers displacement, we can assume that we've now um, the plastic zone has now passed that um, the Bragg peak, which was at about 1300 nanometers. So we can kind of indicate this, this plastic zone extension factor um, of 5.2 times the indentation depth. So that is a big assumption because it, it's unlikely to expand in a linear fashion and it's unlikely, well, from, we, from the GND map that I showed, it's definitely not um, a hemisphere of deformation. But for the purpose of the, the analysis that I'm going to do, um, we're going to just assume that it that it is. And that's this is this factor. Um, it's plastic zone factor. Um, so then to account for the indentation size effect, um, the most common method that people use to analyze the size effect is this Nixon Gal um, analysis. Uh, and it's basically um, a mechanism based string gradient plasticity model that um, assumes a hemisphere of deformation below your indent. And within that hemisphere, you've got these um, loops of geometrically necessary dislocations um, and it extracts that from it extracts the GNDs from the SSDs um, to give you this hardness at infinite depth or non size effect non-size affected hardness value. Um, so if you plot your hardness squared versus um, one over your indentation depth, you get a, a linear, you can do a linear fit to the data. So this is in the unirradiated data um, and extract this uh, H naught value, which is our non-size affected hardness. Um, and then you also get this H star value, which is kind of a characteristic length scale um, from which you can expect to have a size dependent hardness value. Um, if we then apply the Nixon Gal um, model to the irradiated data, again, we use um, that 250 nanometers as our transition depth, um, and we can just apply a linear fit to our irradiated portion of the data and extract um, a non size affected h naught for the for the irradiated layer um and now that is that is giving us a value rather than this kind of decaying hardness profile versus depth and um, but that still is um giving us hardness over a range of um of damage so the damage profile was going from 5 dpa to 40 dpa so this this single value um isn't actually measuring, giving us a value at 16.7 dpa, it's giving us a, a value of the averaged over the entire region. 
So um, we can then um, apply this kind of volume fraction model. So we assume for a particular indentation depth, we've got this hemisphere of volume um, that with the with a depth from that we've estimated from our factor, a plastic zone factor, um, and then we split it into segments. And for each segments, we assign a hardening contribution from the indentation size effect, a hardening contribution from the irradiation damage, and um, also the the unirradiated non-size affected hardness. Um, and then using a volume fraction model, we can we can determine um, the hardness at that depth. So it's essentially with contributions from each of these slices. So in terms of the unirradiated material, um, this hardness contribution from each segment is just going to have the, the indentation size effect term and the H norm. So if we look at just the unirradiated material, we've applied the nixing gal model to get H naught and then we just subtract um, H naught from our damage profile. We can just estimate this um, size effect term as a function of depth. And then if we assume that this is the same, um, the, the size effect term and H naught is the same for both the irradiated and the unirradiated material, then the only additional term we're going to get for the irradiated material is this. And so from our data, the, the additional hardening component is going to be um, due to irradiation damage. And then if we fit um, this function, so we're saying that the, the increase in hardness due to irradiation um, is a function of the, the damage profile, and we can fit this to get some coefficients, um, that we can then put that into our, uh, into this, this equation to identify the hardness contribution from each depth and then put that into the volume fraction model. Um, and this is going to work up to the point that we get saturation. So if we're saying that our hardness increases with this, um, with this formulation, this function, sorry, as a function of dose up to our saturation point, so at 15 dPa, there's no longer any more increase in hardness, so it just remains constant. And then after that, when we reduce that, when, when we've passed our Bragg peak and we're getting a drop in the DPA, we're having a reduction in the, um, the hardness contribution from the irradiation until eventually we're into the, uh, the underlying material that has, has no um, contribution from irradiation damage. Um, so we can get this, this function out and we can fit this to our data to get these parameters. Um, and if you fit that, looking at this, this is the, again, this the same example that I've just been showing throughout the last few slides. Um, the dot, the dotted data is the measured um, hardness versus displacement, and the solid line is the, is using the volume fraction model. Um, and it fits, it breaks down um, at shallow depths, and that's because um, our Nixon Gal model has is it breaks down at shallow depths because you'd have kind of tip rounding in your indenter and you've also got this very um, you're making these assumptions about this hemisphere of um, deformation which which is kind of known to break down at shallow indentation depths but we're going to get these parameters out um, so we've assumed our plastic zone factor we've got these um, these these coefficients to describe our hardening as a function of irradiation damage. Um, and then we, we have hardening contribution at the saturation point, and we've also got our unirradiated non-size affected hardness of the, the T91. Um, and because we're interested in 16.7 dPa, and we've said that it saturates at 15. Um, we can say that our hardening contribution due to irradiation at that DPA is this 2.07. So this is kind of giving us a hardness of of what we're interested in, and it's more it it's more um, it's indicating it's giving us more information than it is just if we look at this curve and kind of assume somewhere around here this is our hardness we're going to measure it from. Um, 
so if we do that for all of the temperatures, so all of the samples that I had, um, what you get is this, uh, so the blue data points here are the hardness of the irradiated, sorry, the unirradiated region of each bar. So just to, just to clarify, um, we've got a bar of material that's heated up and half of it is um, covered. So we have half irradiated and half is unirradiated. So both of these, all of these measures, data points are measured at the um, at the same temperature, or radiated, have been exposed to the same temperatures. So these are kind of just heat treated um, versions of the same of the same bar. Um, so we get this this unirradiated, non size affected H naught values for each of our samples, and then we get our irradiated hardness. And what you see is that at this um, at the lower temperature, you get a lot of hardening, and this drops as a function of um, as we increase the temperature until we get no hardening, and then eventually we see this irradiation induced softening. Um, so how does that compare? So if you look at data from the literature on um, T91, neutron irradiated T91, and this is um, tensile experiments, our combination of ion irradiation and nano indentation is able to kind of predict this um, to, to kind of emulate and show that you get a hardening, a lot of hardening at lower temperatures, which drops as a function of increasing temperature until eventually you get softening. Um, and then you can see there is a slight difference between these temperatures here. Um, but this is a much higher dose rate, and so we would expect some kind of temperature shift. But you are seeing softening um, in both uh, both these experiments. So that's quite promising, and it's showing us that we were able to measure that. Um, we're able to use this technique to kind of emulate what we would expect in a reactor. Um, and so the next the next sort of important part or the next stage of this kind of characterization would be to look at the um, the microstructure and correlate the irradiation induced features with this hardening that we're seeing. And does that compare with what we see in neutron irradiated samples? And so um, if we look at if we use TEM, we can look at the dislocation loops as a function of temperature. So dislocation loops are characteristic of irradiation damage and where we get a lot of hardening at the lower temperature, sorry, so these are the um, these are the temperatures, increasing temperature, um, where we get a lot of hardening, we've got a higher density of these dislocation loops and that decreases um, as we increase the temperature. And then the other feature that we can measure um, are these cavities. So you have small cavities and if they're less than two nanometers, we refer to them as, as bubbles. And if they're larger than two nanometers, we refer to them as, as voids in the material. Um, and these are two irradiation induced features that are associated with hardening because they, they are then acting as obstacles to, um, to our dislocation motion. Um, so to, to kind of correlate that with the, the measured hardness values, um, we can use this dispersed barrier hardening model um, and that is that predicts the increase in the yield stress of the material, um, which is based on the average spacing of the defects. So this is the um, the number density of the defects, and this is the average diameter of the defects. And so the square root of that is going to give us our average spacing. Um, alpha is a term is a strengthening term for each type of obstacle. Um, and then we also have some kind of some material properties in there as well. Um, so if we're assuming the material properties are remaining the same, this alpha root ND term is going to indicate the contribution of each type of defect to the, the strengthening. Um, so first of all, if we look at the loops, so that's the, the dislocation loops, and this is the, the black um, data points on here. That correlates really well with what we're seeing in the hardness because at the lower temperatures we've got um, a lot of contribution. We've got a lot of hardening, which correlates with this uh, the density of the um, dislocation loops. And then as we increase the temperature, they drop until eventually 
we don't have any hardening contribution from from dislocation loops and that's where we've seen no hardening and actually softening in our material. Um, in terms of the cavities and the bubbles, it's not so straightforward and it doesn't correlate as well. So at the lower temperature, we've actually got less, we've got no cavities and we've got um, fewer bubbles, which also, which increases as we increase the temperature and then peaks at this, this mid-range temperature until it then drops off again. And then we don't see any cavities at the higher temperatures. Um, and so that when we, when we then put that into our dispersed barrier hardening model um, and we've converted our yield strength to hardness by a factor of three, um, it, it does, it correlates well for this, this region here, but, but because of what we've said with the lower temperature, um, we're predicting less hardening at the lower temperature than we would, than we've measured. Um, and this could probably be because there are other hardening defects in the material in the material that we haven't measured. So there are actually um, nickel silicon rich precipitates that form from irradiation damage. And they probably well, most definitely increase the, um, or have a strengthening effect on this material. Um, so, so potentially by including that into this, um, we could we could kind of push this up a little bit. Um, but the, the kind of interesting thing here is that we're measuring an irradiation induced softening, um, but we're observing defects in the material that will cause a strengthening effect. So this is this is quite curious and quite an interesting thing um, that we wanted to look at further. Um, so irradiation softening isn't like an unheard of thing. If you think about this material, it's got a really complicated starting microstructure with, um, with lots of network dislocations, and then your you're heat treating it, so you're putting loads of thermal vacancies in, you're going to get recovery of your microstructure. But what we're seeing is recovery of the microstructure due to um, on both sides of our sample, so the heat treated and then it's softer on the irradiated and heat treated side. So this irradiation is causing some kind of accelerated recovery. Um, and the mechanisms of that aren't actually that well understood. The mechanisms that cause this accelerated recovery aren't really understood. Um, so this is some work that was done by my colleague um, at the University of Michigan. And he basically used, um, did some rate theory calculations of the, the, the point defects from, from irradiation. Um, and the reason he did that, he was interested in looking at the cavity growth rate and the, the kind of um, cavity nucleation in these materials. Um, but what he did, he was able to do, um, so if you think about with your irradiation damage, you're putting, you're displacing your um, atoms, creating interstitials and vacancies. Um, this rate theory can calculate um, the fraction of those irradiation vacancies that are lost to, um, to different parts in your microstructure. So a fraction of them are lost to by recombining with the interstitials from the irradiation. A, a fraction of them are lost to sinks in the as-tempered microstructure, so they're uh, they're lost to the um, the kind of network dislocations, um, the pre-existing network dislocations, and then some of them are lost to um, to grain boundaries. So this is really interesting because as we increase our temperature, the fraction of these vacancies that recombine with interstitials reduces, but the fraction of vacancies that are um, lost to the to the network dislocations and annihilating with them increases. So this is saying that at the higher temperatures, more of our irradiation features, um, irradiation vacancies are annihilating with the network dislocations, and therefore you're going to have more recovery and more annihilation of that. Um, which would lead to accelerated softening. Um, this is kind of, I, um, I don't think this is that well understood. So if anyone does know anything more about irradiation induced softening, I would be open to discussions about that and what they think about this. Um, but kind of the next stage would to be, um, is to be uh, look at the, actually measure the, the density of the network dislocations. Um, before and after irradiation, because the TEM that was done before 
we kind of were just interested in looking at the loops. Um, and so we just looked at the dislocation loops in the irradiated material. We didn't really look at the um, the, the heat treated version, so the, the unirradiated side. Um, so it'd be really interesting to kind of compare those two. Um, and that's kind of what we're going to be doing next. Um, in terms, that's sort of the end of what I've been doing with this self-similar indentation. So this is all indentation with a Berkovich indenter. Um, the next thing that I'm going to talk about is uh, spherical indentation. So this is actually a bit of a teaser because it's still in the, the early stages of development. I've not actually got that much data on just yet, but it's something quite interesting. Um, so back to our stress strain curve of irradiated materials. When we are using nano indentation, we're only measuring hardness at, at one, one particular strain. So we're getting a measurement we're just getting one data point on our stress strain curve. Um, and obviously, we want to find out what's going on beyond this. Um, and so um, we can use spherical indentation. So if we indent with a sphere, um, as a function of indented displacement, you can probe an indentation strain and um, measure the indentation stress or the hardness. Um, and because it's blunt, you can measure an elastic region, a yield point, um, and then you can also measure work hardening properties or post yield properties of the material. Um, so you get this kind of indentation stress strain curve, which is obviously in terms of characterising our radiated materials, that's going to be really useful. Um, and so to do that, we need to first define some well, we need to define our strain. So what is indentation strain? Um, there are quite a lot of definition, definitions for indentation strain, but the most the, the most widely adopted one now is this is this definition here, um, which was defined by Pathak and Kalandindi. Um, and it's based on your your indenter contact depth and the um, the contact radius of the indenter. And then your indentation stress can be def defined by the, the force that you're applying over the uh, contact area. So contact area and contact radius are two things that are going to depend on your indented tip. So if you've got a um, nominally a 20, no, 20 micron indented tip radius, um, it's never really going to be a perfect sphere. Um, and so you have to, similar to um, Berkovich indentation, you have to apply an area function. Um, so we've adopted this area function um, of this form, which was defined in Alex Leitner's paper. Um, and to, to kind of get these coefficients, you will, similar to Berkovich indentation, you do some indents in a reference material with a known modulus. And then you you measure the stiffness using your um, CSM signal, or you can just do multiple indents um, at different depths and get your stiffness from the unloading curve. Um, and then you back calculate this um, area area function. Your your sorry your area, which is your projected area, um, as a function of your contact depth. Um, and then you can fit this function to that. And that's kind of going to describe your tip. So this is um, a nominally 20 micron indenter radius. Um, and we've done this fit here and we've got our coefficients out to describe the tip shape. And then you can plot uh, strain as a function of displacement. So this is a problem because strain isn't proportional to displacement um, and it's also not proportional to your load. And inherently in a nano indenter, we have a load controlled instrument. And so we needed to develop this constant strain rate method for a spherical tip. Um, so I've, I've taken this, this plot from Alex Leitner's paper. Um, usually, so we have a, we have a, a load controlled in, instrument. So if we keep our loading rate constant for a sphere, we get this kind of profile of our strain as a function of time. Um, in in 
self similar or Berkovich indentation, we use this um, loading rate over load and keep that constant. And that's going to give us a constant strain rate for for a self similar tip. Um, but when we do that with a sphere, we get this kind of profile. Um, but what we want is, is a constant strain rate for us for a sphere. Um, so to do that, you need, we've written a method in the G200 where we've defined the strain using the definition on the previous slide. Um, and then we give it a target strain rate um, and a target total strain. Um, and actually, um, this isn't as straightforward um, as we'd like, because when you have your initial contact, um, we have an infinite strain. And so we need to start the experiment with a displacement controlled segment. So that's why I don't know if you can see, but you've got these data points here. And that's initially where the the kind of the initial portion where the um, the tip is is kind of getting in settling into the material and that's in displacement control. So we can see our strain rate is massively varying. Um, and then we switch on to our strain controlled portion of the experiment. Um, and our our PID loop kicks in and it kind of keeps it controlled. It, it increases it and then keeps it controlled at this target. Um, now this looks this looks well, I, I'd say this looks like a very well controlled experiment because I've tuned this. Um, but before you do any of the tuning, um, you get this kind of really, really wavy and not a very, very well controlled um, experiment. So this has taken quite a lot of effort to get to this point, doing the fine tuning and getting getting just these really small oscillations. Um, this can probably be tuned a bit better, so I could change the initial displacement rate and so that it stops here before it switches on to the, the strain rate experiment and then maybe we'd, we'd remove this kind of initial drop. Um, but this is kind of where I'm at at the moment and this is this is sort of the, the best the best of quite a, a lot of bad experiments. Um, but once we've got that and we've run the experiment at a constant strain rate, um, we can extract this indentation stress strain curve um, and we can obtain the parameters, we can obtain um, the Young's modulus, a yield stress and some um, power law um, hardening properties. So beyond the yield points, what's, going, what's happening here. Um, this is kind of where I'm at with this work at the moment, which is why I said it was a bit of a teaser. Um, but this is really, really good. It's it's basically the ease of nano indentation, but we're expect, extracting a lot more information from that. Um, so the next kind of steps is how does this compare with uniaxial data? Can we change this definition of indentation strain um, to kind of get it to correlate better with um, with uniaxial data? Um, and then can we um, can we extract mean and control properties from irradiated steels using this method? Um, so yeah, I've put watch this space because that's that's all to come. Um, and so just some concluding remarks. Um, I'm I'm a big advocate of nano indentation. It's it's really easy. This minimal sample prep, um, no fib milling required to create fancy cantilevers. Um, it's it's reproducible and statistically rich. And for this for this application, it's really ideal. Um, but I will highlight that you do need to be careful when you're interpreting the results, because, for example, in this case, we've got the size effect and the substrate effect and whatever your application is, you need to be be careful that you're you're interpreting that hardness measurement for what you're actually trying to measure. Um, and if we combine it with TM, we can we can correlate our hardening defects with um, the, sorry, the microstructural defects with the hardening that, that contribute to the hardness. Um, and we're also able to reproduce this hardening and softening behavior um, in neutron irradiated T91 with the dual beam ion irradiation. Now that's quite, um, that's quite important because if we are gonna use this method as, as a kind of, um, to emulate the neutron irradiation, we need to be able to reproduce that. Um, 
And I know that in single ion irradiation, so without the height, the, the helium, the co-injection of helium, we don't actually measure softening at the same dose and same temperature. So um, understanding that that mechanism a bit more is going to is going to give us more information to kind of understand this this better. Um, so it's, it is something to do with the, with the helium and the kind of the vacancies that are being produced from the radiation damage. Um, and then spherical indentation, it's got all of these above pros, um, but but it's even better. We're able to extract information beyond the yield point, which is going to be really important um, for this for this work. Um, so the next steps, um, I'm going to do some spherical indentation on reactor irradiated steels. And the reason I've chosen reactor irradiated is because obviously as a function of indenter displacement, we're changing our strain. I don't really want to start with an ion irradiated sample that has a varying microstructure as a function of depth. Um, I then want to directly compare it with uniaxial data. Um, and then eventually we're going to do some crystal plasticity modeling um, so that we can we can extract uniaxial properties um, from from indentation, which is essentially a measurement with a very non-uniform strain field. Um, so that's kind of kind of the end and a conclusion. Um, this is again another boring slide, but very important. Um, I'd like to acknowledge Gary Was and Stephen Toller. So I've worked with Gary Was on this um, for these to to get these dual line irradiated samples, and Stephen Toller is um, one of Gary's students. Um, and we're part of this this SNAP project, which is simulating neutrons with accelerated particles, and that is a wider a wider international research project um, that has this Bor sixty reactor irradiation campaign. So eventually, I hopefully will be able to go over to the US and and do some nano indentation on the reactor samples and, and kind of compare them with what I've got from my iron irradiated samples. Um, I'd like to thank Chris Hardy from UK AEA, who is also from Imperial, um, but he's helping me with this spherical indentation method development. Um, and then Rolls-Royce and Bob Odette, who will be providing a really exciting set of samples for us. So the samples that they're going to provide are um, their reactor steel, irradiated steels that were tensile bars and have been broken. So we have uniaxial tensile data from, and then we're going to be indenting the broken pieces. And so we'll be able to directly compare our spherical indentation stress strain curves with the uniaxial. And that's going to that's going to be really exciting. Um, when those samples do arrive. Um, and I've just put a picture of Isaac because I'm that annoying mum that likes to show pictures of my baby. Um, so this was in the Nano Indenter Lab pre-COVID. It's a bit bigger than that now. Um, and thank you for listening. I hope that was useful for you. Oh, that's great, Anna. Thanks a lot for sharing the, the nice talk and the picture of your your, your child, <laughs> your son. Yeah. Yeah, that's great. And thank you a lot, because it's really a detailed study of the effect of irradiation on the nano-indentation. Nano it's really nice. And do any of us have any questions? So I hope maybe I can raise a question first. So I think you show some cavities and you, you group them into smaller ones as some bubbles and bigger one as voice, mm -hmm. right? And are those like the micrographs from the TEMs? Yes, they are. And it's just in terms of the size of those cavities, and I like the first one is how do they form? How do mm -hmm. the cavities form? And when it comes to quantify the size of those black stuff, like because it's 3D thing and in the TEM it's already sliced. So what's the true size in the 3D and in your sections? That's two questions. OK, um, so the cavities form from your irradiation damage. You're, you've got this, uh, you're, you're displacing your atoms and you've got um, interstitials and um, vacancies and your vacancies cluster together and they cause these, form these bubbles and cavities. Um, and then the co-injection of helium then also forms, you, you kind of trap your helium inside these, inside these cavities and voids. Um, in terms of measuring them in the TEM, um, in a 3D sense, 
you are very correct, but we we are assuming it's just a thin slice and we have a 2D image that we're just measuring yep. from that. Um, it's all measured in 2D in terms of the 3D. We're just kind of getting a density, yep. a number density based on, on our on our TEM map of a decent sized area and then calculating. Um, yep. Yeah, we just do like an image J kind of yep. um, analysis to, to measure them. Yeah, I think, yeah, it's, but in this sense, I think maybe it's a bit safer. Like, I don't know, it's just a, a suggestion to don't split them, like don't put them into two groups. The yeah. size. Like maybe just treat them as a, a single group, like because we don't actually know the 3D size of it. Yeah. So they, yeah. So they, the kind of strength. In terms of the strengthening contribution, yeah. um, I have assigned a different obstacle strength to each of them. And so, so yeah, that they are contributing different amounts based on size in that sense. But if, yeah, I agree, um, we could use them as one population and then they'd have the same, the same obstacle strength. Um, yeah, that might improve my my prediction. Yeah, but but as you said, I think the dislocation, the loops, is is a as a major con contribution contribution, right? Yeah. 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 Definitely. Yes. And that and correlates really well with what we're seeing in that the hardness profile. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Thank you. So, any other questions? Yeah. I think if you see the comments, so Thomas asked, is it possible to determine the ductility of the steel after irradiation through nano indentation and will the steel show cracks when indented? Um, I mean these steels won't show any cracking for with indentation. Um, they're at that kind of scale they're going to be very ductile. Um, is it possible to determine the ductility? Well the spherical indentation stress strain curve that we're, we're extracting is, is correlates kind of with a true stress strain curve. Um, I I guess we're going to get an indication of the ductility from that. Um, we're getting kind of work hardening properties. Um, but but no, no, we wouldn't see any cracking. So yeah, we're just kind of interpreting this indentation stress strain curve and using it as sort of a comparison between irradiated and unirradiated to see how how it's changing. I think when we do some crystal plasticity as well, um, I'm going to be doing that with Chris Hardy. The kind of the hope and the kind of project plan that we have is that we're going to do the indent and then model the indent and then use the constitutive laws to then model a tensile bar um, and then compare that with our with our bulk uniaxial data that we've got. Um, and I assume that he will then, if we are seeing kind of brittle behaviour um, in the uniaxial data, he'll be able to in, input that into the constitutive law somehow. I don't really know that much about it. <laughs> well, we'll keep exploring and we'll find out more. Maybe I'll give a follow up um, a talk when I've done a bit more work. <laughs> yeah, I will try to re invite you. <laughs> <laughs> or you probably never want to hear from me again. <laughs> no, definitely, yes. So, yeah, uh, yes, Bjorn, please. Yeah, thanks. Hi, Anna. Thanks for the very interesting talk. So, yes, I'm going to be very interested to see how, when you try to extract out effectively average polycrystal stress strain response from your um, spherical indentation data, how well that works. Because of course, the the difficulty is that the microstructure is very inhomogeneous mm -hmm. and your indentation length scale is of the order of, well, one to two microns and the microstructural features, be they carbides or grain size boundaries and so on, are all going to be influencing that quite strongly. So I guess I would interpret that, uh, well, just from your data, actually, you showed a, a range of differing indentations, I think just to different locations, of course, and you ended up with 15 different um, hardness versus indentation depth curves, and you averaged that, of course, quite, quite rightly. But I'm not sure how, well, my question really is, how, 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 do you, how well do you anticipate using these small scale tests which are carried out over a very small volume where 
crystal gas orientation, grain boundary effects, carbide effects, all influence, influence the behavior. How well would you anticipate generating stress strain curves, which are going to be representative of the macro scale from these micro scale tests? Um, I don't think they're going to match at all. <laughs> um, I, I think they're going to be very, very different um, mm -hmm. for, for obvious reasons. Um, but my plan is to combining it with the modelling. Um, my plan is to use a varying indented radius and then do to kind of understand how that changes as we're changing the kind of the volume, the deformation volume underneath that. Um, and then I'm going to use high res EBSD to, to map my strain fields and correlate that with what we're seeing in terms of a uniaxial strain. I, there, there's not, it's not going to match, but it's going to be, it's going to be an iterative process to kind of redefine the strain um, and then eventually develop a way that we can indicate what uniaxial properties will be from this method. And the reason it's really important is because for this this project with Gary, with Gary was, um, all the bore 60 samples that he's irradiated are three millimeter discs. And so we can't even get uniaxial properties from that. We need to we need to have something that we can we can do on this this kind of scale. Um, so yeah, I think I think it is optimistic to say that oh, I'm going to get stress strain curves out that then I can use to that are going to be directly comparable. They're not going to be comparable at all, but they're going to indicate sort of what direction, what indicates sort of what the properties we would expect. And then hopefully if we can model it and edit our constitutive laws. So it doesn't really work in something like, I think this goes back to, to Thomas's question. Um, it doesn't really work in something like tungsten because that's very ductile when we do an indent and it's really brittle when you pull it in a uniaxial experiment. Um, and so there are there are lots of things that we kind of need to think about in this. Um, but yeah, I don't, I don't know if that answered your question. <laughs> yeah, yeah, sure, sure. So and I think this, if you're if you were able to model explicitly a number of different ind indentation cases where you know you have different microstructures and you've been able to quantify those microstructures, then that would enable you hopefully to get properties associated with the slip rule. And once you've got that, then you, of course, you can scale up to polycrystal uniaxial response. And the hope is you'll be able to make that linkage. And then that, I guess, would be very helpful, wouldn't it? Because yeah. you could then use, use, use that as a methodology to extract our macroscopic polycrystal stress strain response for, um, um, for, from, from those indentation tests. So, yeah, yeah. Although there's still issues of texture. You, you, you haven't mentioned texture, but whether these materials, these fritic steels become strongly textured or, or not. I don't know whether that's an important issue because th th that also would be a key, you know, the, the, uh, the scaling up business from the indentation to, to polycrystal means you have to have knowledge of what polycrystal texture you're talking about in, in, as well, of course. So there are difficulties, but it sounds like a very sensible approach to me. Okay. Yeah, thanks for the, it's a very optimistic project, I think, but hopefully if it works, it'll be very, very useful. <laughs> Exactly, yeah. Great, thanks. Thank you. We have another question as well. Any other questions from our colleagues? Well, okay, it's already one hour. I think it's it's really nice talk. And thank you very much for giving us this presentation. And we will catch up later if we have any further questions. Great. If anyone does use nano indentation or wants to use it um i'm a clearly a big advocate of the technique so i'm always welcome i always welcome coffee virtual coffee breaks if anyone wants to have a chat with me i'm, I'm happy to do so that's great okay okay thank you very thank much you. thank you for coming as well bye, thank you. bye. See you next time.